If you could turn to Psalms 84. We're going to look at verse 9 through 12 and focus on verse 11. And think about what it's saying. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does He withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in You. So we're going to look at verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does He withhold from those who walk uprightly. Here my first question for you today is, verse, verse 10, not verse 11, verse 10, what, what makes a man say what is said right there? What would make a person say that a day in the courts is better than a thousand elsewhere? In the Lord's courts. What would make a man say, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. What makes someone say that? You know, to be at the door is not to be in it. It's just at the entrance. What would make a man say, you know, just one day, not a million days, not an eternity, but just one day there, not inward, but just at the door, that's better than a thousand elsewhere. Well, I want to put forward that a big thing that makes a man say verse 10 is what verse 11 says. Believing that the Lord is a Lord who will not hold one good thing from those who walk uprightly. So verse 11 is what makes a man say verses 10. If you notice as we read it, verse 10 ends, then dwell in the tents of wickedness, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. So I believe he's bringing on, he's giving a reason. One of the reasons why he would rather be one day in the courts of the Lord. You know, the good thing there is we get a lot more than just one day in the courts of the Lord. If you're a Christian, you're going to get an eternity in the courts of the Lord. And another good thing is we're not just at the door. We're in the house with the Lord. So here a question is, how many of you think God is withholding some good thing from you? Just ask yourself that. Is there something right now in your life, a good thing, that you believe the Lord is withholding from you? Does anything come to your mind? Another question. How many of you think a bad thing has been given to you? So think of those two questions. Is there something you think is a good thing that is being withheld? Or is there something that you think is a bad thing that has been given to you? We're going to find comfort and encouragement in this verse in regards to those two questions. I want to bring you this verse today as a hope that it will become an everlasting refuge that you can run to whenever you believe the lie that a good thing is being withheld from you. I want it to be a refuge. You get what I'm saying? It's like you have a... When the fire burns on my house, I'm calling who? The fire department. When someone's robbing, I'm calling the cops. They're a refuge. And so when the devil is telling me God's withholding a good thing from me, Psalms 84.11 can be a good refuge to run to. It can be a good verse to lay a hold of. So let's look. Let's look at verse 11. When someone makes a promise, no good thing do I withhold. One thing that helps us believe the promise is looking at the character of the one who gives the promise. If a guy you know doesn't keep his word comes to you and says, no good thing is going to be kept from you, you're not going to believe him. Because his character is not that which is going to be backed up by him keeping the promise. Yet here the Lord's making us the promise. And if you notice the start of verse 11, 
we have two statements made about the Lord. The first is that the Lord is a sun and shield. The second is that the Lord bestows favor and honor. And after that, a promise is given with a condition. So let's think about the first half of verse 11. Who does it say God is right here? It says He's a sun and a shield. So you think about a sun. We find that in other places, that term used. When you think about sun, you think about light. The sun has light coming from it. It's emitting rays. And the Lord our God is a sun. He's a light even unto our path. He's a light that it sustains everything on earth. He's the light that sustains us. If there's no sun, all the plants out there will die. Yet God is a sun to us. He's that which sustains us spiritually. It says in Isaiah 60, 19, The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God be your glory. Another thing about the sun is not that just it emits light. But the psalmist writes earlier in 72, he says his fame continues as long as the sun. There's multiple places where the sun is put forward not just as this great light, but it's something that continues. There's a timeline of which it's going to last. And so here he's saying the Lord is a sun. He's not just a light for a day. He's a light in your life that's going to continue forever. He's everlasting. Psalms 89 even says that. His throne is long as the sun before me. So the second word we have here about the character of someone, the Lord, who's given us this promise that we need to believe is we hear that He is a shield. I mean, when you think about a shield, you think about protection. And as we think about the Lord being a light, being a shield, think about in your own life, Christian. Is that not true? Has not God been a shield to you at times when the devil is hurling fiery darts at you? And the Lord's been trying to prove His character to you through many trials so that when you come to a promise like verse 11, you're able to believe that promise. So a shield, it defends us against our foe. It protects us from evil. So the Lord God is a sun that lights your way and endures forever. And forever He will be your shield and defend you and not withhold good from you. William Seeker said, Why need a saint fear darkness when he has such a sun to guide him? Or dread dangers when he has such a shield to guard him? Let me read that again. Why need a saint fear darkness when he has a sh- such a sun to guide him? Or dread dangers when he has such a shield to guard him. Reflect on that. Isn't it true, Christian, that the Lord has been a light and a defender in your life? He's been proving His character to you so that when He makes a promise, no good thing do I withhold from those who walk uprightly. It's not some promise that seems far off, but because of His provenness of His character, it seems like, you know what? I can really believe that. Because God has been a light. God has been a shield. I can believe this promise that He's giving to me right now. So He's going to prove Himself all the more in the next phrase. The Lord bestows favor and honor. Or some render it, the Lord will give grace and glory. Grace and favor. Let's think about that. Grace. The Lord gives favor. And when you think about favor, the first thing that comes to my mind is what? The favor that I have before God because the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ has been credited to my account. And now through Christ's merit, I'm righteous before God. I'm not condemned. I'm in the right with the Lord. You know, what what better grace does God give to us than saving, justifying grace? You think about what other grace God gives us. He gives sanctifying grace. The Lord gives us power, grace, to sanctify us. It says the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly lust. And so God has given us grace to help us mortify sin. 
So He hasn't just saved us, but He's sanctifying us. The next word. Let me pray. Lord, I just pray for Your help. Would You, would you free my dull tongue right now to feed Your sheep? Lord, we just want to be free. We want to have liberty. We want Your Word to speak to our hearts. Amen. We're looking at Psalms 84.11. The Lord bestows favor or grace and honor or glory. So let's think about honor or glory. Maybe think about Psalm 73. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will receive me to glory. So one way that's safe to look at this text is he's saying the Lord bestows justification. He bestows saving grace. He gives sanctifying grace. And then the Lord gives honor or glory. He receives you into heaven. And so not only am I going to be justified, but I will be glorified. As Romans 8 says in the New Testament, those whom He justifies, He also glorifies. You can't have one and not have the other. You can't have favor and not have honor. The man who's been favored by the Lord is going to be honored by Him. And the greatest honor we can have is not to be a doorkeeper, but to be in the house, to be adopted into the family of God, to be a child of the Lord. And that should give us confidence again to believe this promise we're going to see. You think of Romans 8.32. He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He also with Him gracious, how will he also with Him not also with Him graciously give us all things? So think. Okay, if God gives favor and honor, so will God not also give good things if He has given us the greatest things? And we've all heard the Romans 8 argument. If He's given the greatest His Son, how much more will He not give the lesser? And Psalms 84.11 in a way is another way to look at it. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's look at the second half of Psalms 84.11. No good thing does He withhold from those who walk uprightly. First, we're given a promise. No good thing does He withhold. The next thing we're given is a condition from those who walk uprightly. <clears throat> so we're going to look at the promise first and then the condition. And as we look at this promise, remember the character of God that we just saw. He is a light. He is a shield. He is your defender. He has bestowed favor. He has bestowed glory. He's going to get you to heaven. In light of that, I should find it all the easier to believe that He won't withhold anything good from me. One, one question first off, is this a New Testament reality? No good thing does He withhold. Again, we all know Romans 8.28. All things work together for good. For those who love God and are called according to His purpose. And again, we need to have this mindset as a Christian. Everything's working together for my good. I've got to see that perspective as a Christian. It'll help me make sense of, of trials. and It'll help me make sense when something's withheld from me that I believe is a good thing. So, there's three implications, I believe, that I could think of in the second half of this verse. No good thing does He withhold. The first thing is that God is the one doing the withholding. If the Lord's able to say, no good thing do I withhold, the one who is the withholder is also the giver. And so we've got to realize God is the one doing the withholding. If there's something in our life and we're walking uprightly and we believe it is a good thing and we're not getting it, we've got to be able to come to the grips to realize the Lord's the one who's not giving that to me. And we'll think about why He isn't in the next point. But think of that. God is the withholder. Because if He's the one who can say, I'm not withholding, clearly He's the one who withholds. In Genesis 30, Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. He said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of your womb? You know, God's the one who withheld. And we've, we need to recognize that in our own lives. 
another implication in this text. There are things that we think would be good right now, but are not. If the verse says, no good thing does God withhold, yet here a good thing is being withheld, the verse is either wrong, or it's true, and the thing that I think is good is not good right now in the present. You get what I'm saying? So that is a good thing, but it's not good right now pertaining to time of the giving. And so God isn't giving it yet. If God truly withheld good from you, then we wouldn't be able to have confidence in this verse. We wouldn't be able to believe no good thing does He withhold from those who walk uprightly. Now, why is that thing not good? It's not because it's sinful. Again, he who finds a wife finds he who has a wife finds a good thing. Okay, a wife is a good thing, but why are many single people not having a wife? Is it because a wife is a sinful thing? No. It's not because it's a sinful thing. It's because it's not a good thing at the parent time in your life. And God hasn't chosen to give you that yet. So God in love keeps back. He refrains from giving. You know, think of even how our government works. The government knows it's not a good thing to give a driver's license to a 10-year-old child. The 10-year-old child is not at the point where they can have a driver's license and drive safely. If you give a 10-year-old child a driver's license, what will happen? They will wreck the car probably. So a license is a good thing. But given too early, given at not the proper time, it can lead to distraction. It can lead to suffering. You know, Hebrews 11, we find there, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, the land of Canaan, since God had provided something better for us. If there's something that is good that you're not getting, you need to trust God's going to give you something better. Or He'll give you that which is good at a better time. Well, God help us. Let's think of this a third implication. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm cutting through the air. There are things not being withheld that may appear bad, but we must realize they are good things. I mean, let me make sure I'm getting these thoughts across. Okay, the verse says what? No good thing does God withhold. Okay? Here this thing comes in my life and I think, well, that's a bad thing. But if all things work together for my good and no good thing does God withhold and God didn't withhold from giving me this thing that I believe is a bad thing, then what's the conclusion? The thing isn't a bad thing. I may conclude that's not a good thing. But if no good thing He withholds and He saw fit to not withhold from me this suffering, this trial, I need to be able to conclude The reason He didn't withhold that from me is because it's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. All things work together for good. This will work together for my good somehow. It's a good thing from God. We need to see these things as that. You know, the verse in a way, it teaches the bitter is sweet and the sweet would be bitter if given too soon. If you get it too soon, that which can be good can then become bitter. You know, one example, you think about Scott Haney just preached on John 11. Okay, what was best? That Christ come and heal Lazarus? No. The good thing was Christ lets him die, comes and raises him from the dead. It looked like a good thing had been withheld, but in a biblical perspective, we recognize in the end a good thing wasn't withheld. A better thing was given. So if we doubt God at that time when Lazarus dies, well, the Lord withheld a good thing. He had something better. And even if He doesn't come and raise Him from the dead, God has something better in mind with Him dying. You think about Joseph. Was it a good thing that Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers? It looked bad at the time, but in the end it was a good thing. 
because he was raised in the power. When the famine hits the land, Joseph was to, able to deliver his family. So it appeared like a bad thing had been given, but it was a good thing because God works all things together for our good. God does not withhold a good thing from those who walk uprightly. You think about John 17. Jesus said, it is your advantage that I go away. It didn't appear like a good thing for Christ to go away. But what was better is that He went away and He sent a Spirit, the Helper. I guess those, those three implications I, I, I think are there as we think about it. They're to help you to believe the promise. What the devil wants is for you to read this verse that no good thing does God withhold and he wants you to read it and say that's not true. Because that bad thing was given to me. But if you look at it, Joseph went to prison. It wasn't a bad thing. In the end, it was a good thing. So we need to see things like that. And we don't have the advantage of seeing the beginning and the end of the story because we're in the middle of it. And so that's why we've got to take God at His Word and trust Him that that bad thing apparently will work for good in the end. And He didn't withhold good for me. He didn't give bad to me. He gave good to me. He didn't give bad to me. He gave good to me. We need to believe that. And then that other implication, we need to be able to come to grips. There are things that are good and not sinful that we think we need, but it is not a good thing at that time. I mean, someone in here is probably praying for a good thing, and God is withholding it from you. Well, why is He withholding it from you? Because it's not a good thing yet. If it was, He would give it because He promises no good thing does He withhold. Now, there is a condition. We're going to look at that. In a minute. One verse to think about even. Philippians 4. My God will supply every need of yours according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He's going to provide every need. let's, Let's think about the condition. Those who walk uprightly. Now, I don't think this is just... First, this, the first question you should ask yourself is, are you a Christian? Because this doesn't apply to you if you're lost. Because you're not upright in a sense that you're saved. But the text says, for those who walk uprightly. So I don't just think he's saying those who are upright in a sense they're justified, they're a Christian. But he's saying, the Christian, are you walking with a clear conscience? Are you upright in a sense where... As the Holman Christian Standard says, do you have integrity? Are you walking with integrity right now? You know, is your motive right? We think about James 4. It says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And so if there's a good thing you're praying for and it's being withheld, one reason may be because you're not walking uprightly. Your motive may be wrong. Maybe some self involved, and that thing is a good thing, and God's not giving it. Well, why? Well, there's a condition from those who walk uprightly, meaning, not am I perfect, but am I walking upright in a sense of a clear conscience, integrity, or am I being deceitful? Is there known sin in my life that I'm not dealing with? <clears throat> Think about it like this say this is a cup, okay? Water in this cup is a good thing, right? Well, if the cup is not upright and it's laying on the side, say there's no lid, it would be unloving for me to come along and to pour water into the cup because the water would just flood right out. But once the cup is upright, now all the more that good thing can be poured into the cup. And so the Lord, in in a sense, if there's a good thing you're not getting and it's because you're not upright, then what you need to do is get upright. And that doesn't mean instantly God's going to give you that spouse or give you that blessing. But now you're in a place where you're prepared with a clear conscience that who knows, five years, five days, God may give that thing that's a good thing to me. But we've got responsibility to be walking uprightly. It's not cruel for God to not give us something because we've got sin that we're not dealing with. Just as it would be cruel if I poured water into a cup on its side because it would all flood out. You know, how often, you know, here a guy is, he's wanting to be married, but yeah, say he's involved in sin in his life. 
Is it a good thing for God to then come along and give the man a wife? Well, now he gets that wife too early and he destroys his marriage. Rather than God in love says, I'm waiting, there needs to be more sanctification here, then I'm going to give this good thing to him. Just like the car. You give a car to a kid too early, he wrecks it. Because he doesn't know how to drive it. The good thing, the car, is now destroyed because it was given at bad timing. <clears throat> so, how is the truth that no good thing does God withhold? How is it relevant to you? <clears throat> If you are walking upright and there is anything good that you think is being withheld, recognize that that is not true. I mean, just get that one thing, if anything, from this this sermon. God promises, I will not withhold good from you. So if you're here today and you're a Christian and you're upright and you think God's withholding good, His Word clearly says He's not. And the way to process that is to realize not that, oh, the spouse or that thing is sin. It's not that it's a bad thing. But it's that God knows the perfect timing to give you that thing. And so then the question comes, well, I want the good thing. What do I do in the meantime in order to get the thing where it becomes... Here the good thing is, what needs to happen for the good thing to be given to me? Well, the thing to do is just to walk uprightly. And trust, the Lord's going to give it in His proper timing. He gives us something to do. Walk. Not not stand uprightly, walk uprightly. Moving forward, going in a direction. Not being stagnant, just waiting around. Lord, give me, give me. But no, I'm walking, following Him, trusting He's not withholding anything good from me. Now another, again, this applies to you. if, If there's some good thing you want, And you know it's good. Just like the Proverbs say, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Clearly the Bible teaches a wife is a good thing. And you're praying and God's not giving you a wife. One area to check is am I walking uprightly? And again, once you start walking uprightly, it doesn't mean God's going to zap give it to you. It just means you're you're meeting this condition. It doesn't mean He's going to instantly give it. Psalms 119.11 says, I've stored up Your Word in my heart that I might not sin against You. You want to store this promise in memory to keep you from sinning against the Lord. You know, here you are this evening, for example, say something happens, you're feeling kind of depressed, you're at home, and you know, the devil's just saying, God is withholding good from you. He's just saying that. God is withholding good. And you're thinking, oh, Lord, I mean, I'm, from what I know, my conscience is clear. I'm not willfully living in sin. I love you. I'm wanting to be your doorkeeper in your house. It's better than a thousand elsewhere. What's a good way right then to take comfort? To just think of this verse. Wait, the Lord, He's been a sun, a light to me. He's been a shield. He's protected me. He's already bestowed me the favor of justification and He's going to give me glorification. No good thing does He withhold from me. If He's given me all of that, there's no way He'll withhold this good thing from me. So what the devil is telling me right now that God is withholding good from me, that's just not true. That promise, I've hidden it in my heart that I might not sin against God by doubting the character of God and believing He's withholding good from me. Because that's a sin. To think, well, the Lord doesn't love me. The Lord isn't this and this and that. And we've got to hide promises like this in our heart to keep us from sin. Now, how often depression comes because you don't believe promises like this. And you think God is just not giving me some good thing. A lot of times that just reveals selfishness anyways. The person isn't walking uprightly. They're fitted in a self-pity puddle. Yeah, you know, this verse, it really hit me when, you know, many of you know, when I had asked my wife to marry, or Bethany to marry me, she had said no. And I came back driving from Missouri, and I thought, I thought to myself, Lord, it was so clear, I thought that you were telling me you are going to give her to me as a wife. But here she said no. 
And I, tr- I thought, how can I make sense out of that? This one verse, you could have taken every other verse away. That one verse gave me the answer. No good thing have I withheld from you, James, by having her say no. Because if I gave her to you now, it wouldn't have been a good thing. It would have been bad timing. Something else has got to happen first in her life or your life before I give her to you. Whether you're, you're praying for a spouse, ministry opportunities, a child, whatever. There's something that God, God, God isn't you know, random in His doings. The Lord isn't mindless. He has a plan. He has an intricate plan in why He's withholding that good thing from you. Or why He's given you that thing you think is bad that is actually good. <clears throat> What should I do then? How should I live? Well, Psalms 34 says, the young lion suffers want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Again, the thing to do is seek the Lord. The thing to do is to walk uprightly. It's not to so focus on the good things and and wonder why is He not giving, but be content. God is not giving. It's not time. I'm going to follow Him. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And I'm going to trust that everything's going to be added unto me. The good things I think I need that He hasn't given me will be given to me at the right time. Or they may never be given to me in this life. And maybe He has something far better. Like heaven. So some, some thoughts, to, some things to remember. Okay, remember who God is. He has been a light to your path and protected you. Remember, He has given us favor and honor, grace and glory. Remember, we get far more than just being a doorkeeper in the house of God. Remember, we get far more than just one day in His courts. Psalms 23 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell not at the door, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, again, verse 10. What makes a man say, a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere? It's when you realize the person's courts you're in is one who is not withholding anything good from you, and the person's courts you're in is the one who while we were not upright, while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, He gave us His only Son and He sacrificed Him to pay our sin debt and save us from sin's penalty and sin's power. And so if He's done that, then it should be very easy in faith to trust, Lord, You're not withholding any good thing from me. Look at the last verse in this passage, verse 12. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. And the word blessed there, even another way it's rendered is happiness. Happy. O Lord of hosts, happy is the one who trusts in you. I'm a lot happier now that I didn't manipulate and force something, whether it's in regards to a spouse, whether it's in regards to ministry opportunities, whether it's in regards to buying a house, whatever it is. I'm happy, I'm blessed, that rather than force something because I thought God's withholding something, I trusted the Lord. And if if you look at your Christian life, you will find any time you thought God was withholding good, and you just pressed on uprightly, and then He gave you that good thing later, you would easily be able to say, you know what, I'm thankful He gave it to me now and not now. If He would have given it to me right here, that would have been bad. That would have been bad timing. He gave it to me at the perfect timing. So if He perfectly has a perfect record of not failing us, then when you're tempted in the present, go to this promise. Hide it in your heart that you would not sin against the Lord. If you trust that God is not withholding anything from you, then you will be happy. Not because of what God has given you, but because you have God who is so faithful guiding you. You get that? I'm not just wanting to be happy 
because God gives me things. I'm just happy because He's the one who's guiding me. And no matter what He gives me, at least I've got Him as my perfect guide who promised to not withhold anything good from me. So I think that's, that's all I've got. I guess, again, the, the, the question to ask yourself, the th- this is for the believer. And look, if you're not saved here today, wouldn't you want a promise like this that you could lay hold of? Wouldn't you want someone in your life? Because your parents can't, they're not going to be able to say that. None of us can. The only one who can is the Lord. He's the only one who will not withhold good. But if you're not a Christian, isn't that such a good reason to say, you know what, the Lord is worthy of me to follow. The Lord is one who provides stability because He gives things at the perfect timing without fail. And then, yeah, if you're a Christian, there's something right now that you think that's a good thing God's withholding. Or that's a bad thing, why'd He give it to me? Remember this verse. No good thing has He withheld. So the bad thing He gave is actually good. The bitter is sweet. And then the sweet thing that you don't want, that you want, would be bitter if you got it now. But, I guess that's all. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray You would... Lord, help us to believe this verse. Lord, even if we just take all these... everything I said away, and we just read this one verse these last 40 minutes, in a way it says it itself. It's plain. It's clear. It's not confusing. No good thing do you withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing. Lord, we're thankful that we serve you. Lord, we're thankful. Lord, we rejoice that the things you have withheld from us that we thought were were good, but were actually bad in the present. Lord, we're thankful that you didn't rush to give it to us. We're thankful, Lord, that we didn't sinfully manipulate or force it. And Lord, even if we did do that, and You gave it to us anyways to discipline us, we're thankful for that even that has worked together for our good. And we haven't been left condemned. And that You will not just give us favor, not just give us grace, but Lord, You're going to bring us to glory. And we're not just going to be a doorkeeper, but we're going to be in Your house. Lord, we're not just going to be there a day. We're going to be there for all of an eternity. Lord, a day is good enough Being a doorkeeper is good enough. Would You give us a thousand times better? And Lord, thank You for that. Thank You for giving us Your own Son and not sparing Him, but slaughtering Him. That our sins could be forgiven, that we could be redeemed. And we just want to rejoice in You today and we proclaim that You're the the Lord and You're good and You've never wronged us. And as Job said, even though You slay us, we will hope in You because Your hand is not short. And you, You do all things well, all things good. In Jesus' name, Amen.